All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Housing Element Update webinar for March. Uh, my name is Christopher Jordan. I'm the Director of Strategic Planning and Innovation for the City. Uh, joined this afternoon by Sarah Bontrager, our Housing and Public Services Program Manager. Um, between us, we'll go through the presentation today. As you're probably aware, on February 12th, the City released the draft 2021 to 2029 Housing Element for public review and comment and it was accompanied by the release of the draft supplemental EIR or environmental impact report. Today's webinar will focus exclusively on the housing element itself. We'll go over the goals and policies and action items that are included and a few of the other technical sections that are part of the document. For the EIR though, we'll not be reviewing that today. We have a separate webinar scheduled for March 17th to review and receive feedback on it. So if you're interested in that, I encourage you to sign up on the website um, under the e housing element EIR page. So you can go to elkgrovecity.org slash housing element, and then there's a sub page you can get to from the navigation on the left-hand side. So with that, a uh, couple of housekeeping items we'd like to go over first. First, uh, we are recording this event. Our intent is to get it uploaded to the project website uh, in the coming days. So for those that can't attend, you can go back and watch it or uh, be able to watch it. Um, we've disabled video and audio throughout uh, to start to help preserve bandwidth um, and let you focus on the slides. But certainly if you have questions, uh, the Q&A button should be down at the bottom. You can go ahead and type those in. And at the end of the presentation, uh, you can use the raise hand feature to, um, to ask your questions and we can turn mics on one at a time. We'll get to the Q&A uh, at the very end though, after we go through the presentation. So what's included today, I mentioned briefly a moment ago, uh, but again, we wanna go over what is in the housing element, the draft uh, that we've released for review and comments and some of the components. We'll spend some specific time focusing on the goals and action items, reviewing some of the key revisions to the policies and particularly the new implementing actions. And then we'll highlight the project schedule a couple of times. And of course, it is an opportunity for uh, you to ask questions and us to uh, get you answers the best we can on those or identify things for follow-up. Uh, if you'd like to follow along in the document as we go through the presentation today, you can visit the project website, again, elkgrovecity.org slash housing element. So I will jump into the housing element now and just give you a little bit of overview on the project and the effort and the components that are included. Uh, for those of you that may not be aware, the housing element is part of the city's general plan. Uh, which is the fundamental planning document that directs future growth, development, and conservation policy in the city and reflects the long-range vision of the community. It's made up of eight mandatory elements as well as various optional elements or topics, one of which is housing. The housing element is the only one that is subject to state approval and certification on a set schedule or what we refer to as cycles. Uh, this year, we'll begin the new housing element cycle for 2021 that will extend through 2029 or into 2029. Uh, by statute, we are required to have the element adopted by May 15th of this year. Uh, that is our goal. There is a grace period the state gives, and we're trying not to use any of that if we can. Um, that deadline, though, of May 15th, again, is set in state law and cannot be changed. There's no avenue to appeal or automatically move it. Um, the state has set up a series of goals uh, among them for the housing element. Uh, among them include adequately planning to meet the housing needs of everyone in a community, uh, designating policies to encourage the production of housing, and ensuring the cities and counties have adequately zoned land at a variety of densities to support different housing types. We'll talk briefly about what that means in a little bit, but essentially there is uh, and has been for a while a housing crisis in California. And the housing element is one mechanism by which the state uh, tries to address that by making sure that local agencies are planning for the housing needs of their community uh, and ensuring there's available opportunities for development. What does the housing element cover? Uh, there's a variety of topics and we'll go through some of those today, including an analysis of existing and projected housing needs, inventory of land available for housing to meet the regional housing needs allocation arena. And we previously talked about this at a town hall webinar back in, at the end of July, uh, but we'll, again, we'll touch on it briefly today. There's an analysis of potential constraints on housing and opportunities the city can look at to address those constraints. There are evaluation of our previous housing element programs and policies. And then finally, the goals of policies and implementation programs themselves. And that's where we'll spend the bulk of the time today on. Setting the stage for it though, uh, 
the goals and actions, what are they? So goals in the broadest sense are a blueprint for achieving the community vision. They're meant to be a direction setter. They can be abstract, of course. And we set these at the city level. So these are not necessarily uh, verbatim uh, policies or goals that come out of the state necessarily. We use these or we develop these based upon the local context. But it does have to integrate with the city's other general plan goals and policies or what we refer to as consistency. Actions are the city's to do. What are those things we're gonna undertake in order to try to achieve our goals um, and the policy, implement the policies that are in the housing element? Uh, we have to do these implementation items within the time frame, so they are time dependent. And then we report back on these annually through the general plan annual report, which is due by April 1 of every year. Uh, actions are then updated, or, or actions within the document are being updated to address state law, as you'll see later, and to incorporate feedback from staff. We've also had some feedback from, uh, from the public as well. We did a webinar back in uh, October, where we have an opportunity to receive some feedback on that. And then we've had some individual conversations with um, housing advocacy groups um, from around the region. In terms of the project schedule, uh, this is uh, essentially a multi-year effort that began um, you know, really in late 2019, but got really going uh, in winter of 2020, about this time last year. Um, and over the course of the last several months, we've been working through uh, site identification and outreach efforts and through analysis of housing needs uh, and the sort of the, the setting the stage of what is the Elk Grove um, housing circumstances, um, ultimately culminating in the release of the document uh, early last month in February. Um, and we're heading into the public hearing process that uh, hopefully beginning uh, in April, we'll start with planning commission hearings and then have the city council hearing again by that May 15th deadline. So now we'll move to the housing element itself and talk uh, a little bit about what is in it. Um, if you've had a chance to look at the document, you'll notice there are 12 uh, sections within it, which are listed here. Um, much of the content that is in the housing element is closely regulated in state law, but the city is given uh, flexibility for how it is adopted and incorporated into the larger general plan. So what we note in the document is that the first couple of sections, the goals and policies in particular, will be adopted into chapter four of the general plan, which is, deals with urban and rural development. And that's where the existing goals, policies, uh, goals and policies of the housing element, the existing housing element are located today. Uh, section two, which deals with the implementation actions will be adopted into chapter 10, the implementation strategy. So there's a section in the implementation strategy table, uh, which identifies specifically those that relate to housing. Those will be replaced in full by those that are listed here uh, in section two. Um, the balance of the document, sections three through 12, will ultimately be adopted as a technical appendix in chapter 12 of the general plan. And again, you can see that existing technical appendix in the existing general plan if you're interested. Um, we're presenting everything in one document in the format that we have it uh, today up on the website. So it's all in one place. It'll make it easier to review. Um, you will see some introductory text before section one that explains how it's laid out and, and how we intend to move forward through the adoption process. Um, we'll go through the goals, policies, and actions in a moment, but first wanted to walk you through some of the key sections of the balance, balance of the document. First and foremost, the document looks at what Elk Grove's housing need is. Uh, this is actually determined first at a regional level by the state housing uh, and community development department. Um, so they actually identify regionally what is needed uh, for the Sacramento region within the planning period of 2021 to 2029. That is then distributed amongst all the local jurisdictions, the various cities and counties in the region by the Sacramento Area Council of Governments or SACOG. And what they've identified through the process they've gone through and their boards adopted is the numbers that are up on the screen. That's our housing need, what's been determined for Elk Grove as the need during the planning period. The need of 8263 or 8,263 units is divided up by income category. And these are based on the area income uh, tables. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with that information. Um, ultimately, the state then translates these or expects jurisdictions to translate these uh, income categories into zoning designations, uh, which are based ultimately on density. Uh, we've covered this in previous webinars, so I won't spend too much time on it today, but essentially our low and very low income units 
are meant to be covered by higher density residential development uh, above 20 units an acre. Um, ideally higher well, is always better uh, in the eyes of the state. And then the moderate income and above moderate income units can be addressed through any residential density. Um, so typically we look at more traditional single family development, say five uh, to 10 units an acre, even up to 15 units an acre in some cases, depending upon the category type. So as we start planning for that need, we have to look at what adequate sites we have available uh, in order to address these needs. And adequate sites have the proper zoning to support housing development at the densities that it can achieve those income targets. Again, the uh, moderate above moderate and the low and very low categories. Um, what we've, our analysis to date has shown is we have adequate sites to meet the moderate and above moderate income targets or income objectives. But for the low and very low objectives, uh, we received a substantial increase uh, this planning period. Um, so additional sites are going to be needed. The city has identified 43 possible sites, 18 are existing from the current housing element that have not been built on, and 25 new candidate sites that are located within the city limits, the existing city limits that could be uh, designated to accommodate housing to meet the regional housing needs allocation. So for the low and very low income groups. Uh, the city council will ultimately select sites from this list, which we're showing up here in visual form on the map, uh, as part of the adoption process for the housing element. Uh, and these sites would ultimately be then be the ones that are selected uh, subject to a general plan land use amendment and a rezone as necessary in order to get them into the appropriate zoning designations and density ranges. Uh, ultimately, the council could choose all the 43 sites only some of them or some combination of the 43 sites uh, in order to meet the objectives. Um, those sites that are chosen again would have necessary general plan amendments and rezones done concurrently in order to meet those density obligations. Additionally, the city is considering rezones to some existing sites that would increase the minimum density required on them. Um, the draft housing element lists all 43 of those sites and you can see more details about them uh, in the document, there's some discussion on some of them in a few places. Um, and then the environmental impact report also analyzes all 43 of those as well. Ultimately, staff will make a recommendation on uh, which sites we think ought to be included uh, later in the process as we get into the planning commission hearings uh, and then into the city council. But ultimately the final decision really rests with the council on which sites they'd like to see included. Informing staff's recommendation and uh, the council and planning commission selection are a number of feedback opportunities. We've been reaching out to property owners uh, that are on these potential sites list, but also out across the community. Um, we've highlighted the outreach process through a couple of uh, newsletters that have gone out, both our standard one, as well as a standalone um, outreach newsletter that occurred back at the end of May of 2020. Um, and we're giving folks the opportunity to go up onto the website, take a look at the sites and fill out this housing plan uh, and identify which sites that they would support or think ought to be included in there. So if you've not had a chance to use the website and fill it out uh, and leave your comments, I encourage you to do so. We're getting ready to close that process so we can start analyzing the data in the coming uh, weeks. So if you haven't had a chance um, or you know friends or neighbors that haven't had a chance to lose it, please or use it, please, uh, please go up to the site now uh, and take a look at it and fill it out. Uh, the next section of the housing element deals with housing resources and incentives. Um, essentially, the city's affordable housing projects um, often include um, funding from a variety of sources, including um, low-income housing tax credits, maybe HUD financing, or even local funding that the city can provide in order to get these projects constructed. And some of the local incentives that we provide and some of these occur statewide through state mandated programs. Um, but we do provide financial assistance to some projects on a competitive basis um, through our affordable housing impact fee program. Uh, we can provide expedited development review in some cases and streamline processing. Often this takes the form of leveraging the housing element EIR as a mechanism to cover the sequel review. And this, um, we look at these on a case by case basis to make sure we're consistent with CEQA. Um, there are opportunities for fee waivers and reductions, and there's a couple of related programs to that that are detailed out in the housing element. Um, and then we do have procedures for looking at uh, deviations or modifications of development requirements. 
Um, there's specific deviation allowance and procedures you can go through and approvals the planning commission or the city council can provide. Um, our design review process provides a level of flexibility as well. Um, there's also the density bonus program, which is actually a state mandated requirement uh, that cities and counties provide. So we do offer that as well. Um, I will note on the density bonus, there were some recent changes to state law on that, and we're working on updating our local procedures and regulations around it. Next, the housing element goes through various constraints that exist towards the production of housing. Uh, these exist in two categories, non-governmental and governmental. I'll highlight briefly all of both of these. In the non-governmental category, these can include land availability. There may just not be land available um, or on the market to purchase for construction uh, of new housing units. Environmental constraints are also something that exists. Maybe there's wetlands on a site or uh, existing um, natural resources, maybe something like foraging habitat for native species. Um, and those need to be considered and can be a constraint because of maybe mitigation requirements or limitations on construction. Land cost is also one. Obviously, California, our land values continue to increase, uh, especially over the last couple of years. Um, that can be a constraint towards the production of housing. Construction costs as well, those continue to go up both on the labor and material side. And then on the availability of financing, both public and private financing opportunities uh, do have limitations. In terms of governmental constraints, which are those things the city has a little bit more control over, uh, these can include land use controls, what our development standards look like, um, site improvement requirements, our own development impact fees and processing fees, um, and then just the overall development permit and approval process. So the draft housing element goes through these, provides uh, some detail on each of them to understand what the context is uh, and what should be considered in setting out the programs and policies of the housing element. Uh, the last section I'll go over here are the opportunities for energy conservation. Uh, this is a section, again, required out of state law because much of the housing element uh, is based on requirements that are in state law. Um, we note in here there's two key provisions that we look at um, as opportunities for energy conservation when new housing instruction. First is the implementation of the state uh, energy building code, which was last updated in 2019 and will be scheduled again for updates, I believe, in 2022. Um, so that includes requirements such as solar panels on all new single family and certain types of multifamily development, uh, those that are three stories or less, uh, higher levels of insulation than was previously required in prior building codes, uh, updating the thermal envelope requirements, and improved ventilation standards. On top of that, the city has adopted a climate action plan, uh, which has certain programs and policies in place uh, and then is implemented by some certain development standards. Uh, in order to promote uh, uh, energy conservation, energy uh, use reductions um, in the same sort of space. So we have um, requirements for additional energy efficiency in new construction, um, phasing in zero net energy standards for new construction, um, electrification in new and existing residential development. So opportunities, I think it's up to 10%, minimum 10% of new construction needs to be all electric. Um, we're seeing opportunities and, and forecasting that may be coming more at the state level in the future. Um, this gets out in front of it a little bit. Um, sort of full, they take requirements in commercial and residential development. Some of that's actually driven by the energy code. Um, and then opportunities to partner with SMUD in their green energy and solar shares program as opportunities to further um, facilitate uh, green energy production. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Sarah Bontrager to go over the goals and actions. Sarah. Thank you, Christopher. Yes, I'm Sarah Bontrager. I'm the city's housing and public services manager. Um, and so I've, I've worked closely with Christopher on this effort and um, we'll cover today a little bit about what our specific goals and actions are. We have some that are carrying over from previous years and some that are new. Um, let's see. So starting with the goals, these goals are very similar to the goals that we've uh, that we had in our last housing element. Um, and we we thought that they all really still apply. We want to make sure there are enough sites to accommodate Elk Grove's housing needs. That aligns with uh, when Christopher was talking about the need to rezone sites um, using our some of our existing sites, but also looking at a number of other candidate sites. Um, we need to develop more housing for lower income and special needs groups. 
um, removing governmental constraints. So things that might, uh, might make it more difficult for developers to come into our community and build housing. We wanna make sure that we're conserving and improving the existing housing stock that we have. Um, we do in fact have quite a few affordable units over, um, over 2000 that the city has funded um, and some that existed previously. And we wanna make sure that those remain affordable to our residents. Um, promoting a variety of housing opportunities for people in our community of all incomes um, and also just preserving, conserving and improving the existing housing stock, which also aligns with goal number six, which is preserving specifically those house, um, housing developments that were set aside for lower income households. So we do have some key policy changes that uh, you'll see in the housing element. One of, the, um, one of them is that we wanted to provide for um, the subdivision of larger sites into smaller sites. Um, so we, we have a number of sites in the city that are larger than 10 acres. Um, and we included a few of those in, our la in the last round of our housing element. Um, what we found is that that's really too big to be viable for a single affordable housing project. Most of the affordable housing that's built in the community at this point is somewhere between 60 and 150 units. Um, and so developers are really looking for smaller sites. Um, and we did have one of the, in the, last, uh, in the last couple of years, we had one of the larger sites. A 12 acre site was broken into three smaller sites for development um, of affordable housing. And so um, we wanted to kind of enshrine that in our housing element to make sure that we have policies in place that help people to take those larger sites and make them into sites that can support multiple projects. Um, another new policy is that we will allow housing developments that have at least 20% affordable housing by right on our lower income sites that we've counted in previous housing element cycles. This one is a bit of a technicality. Um, the state has this requirement. However, all of our sites that we have counted for, um, for credit for lower income, the lower income arena, uh, have always allowed affordable housing by right. Um, so housing, uh, housing with 20% affordable housing would be included right along with housing that's 100% affordable housing. And then we have one, uh, one other key policy change. And this is, um, this is just a, a bit of a revision clarification um, to align with the goal of affirmatively furthering fair housing. And so our housing element this time focuses a little bit more on making sure that we are preventing discrimination in, in the sale or rental of housing based on those characteristics that are protected um, by the state of California, and uh, in some cases also by federal law. So we, our strategy was to first look at the actions that we had in the last housing element. There were 39 of them, um, which, is, which is a big list. Um, and we, so we, we first sat down and we looked at which of the actions had been completed. Some of them were very specific, rezoning certain pieces of land, for example. Um, and so those actions that were completed, we, uh, we took off the list. Um, we also looked at whether we had some overlap between our actions um, and consolidated those where we could. Um, and then we chose to really look at those actions that we felt were gonna make a meaningful impact within the next eight years in our community. Um, and we've had some previous public meetings and asked for public input as well as met with uh, some housing advocacy groups to look for new ideas and new strategies. And I think that you'll see that we've reflected some of that in our new programs. Um, from here, all the actions are subject to state review and request. And so, Often the state will come back and they'll ask us to add a new action or, you know, um, fully flesh out something. Um, and so we we don't know yet what the state will tell us uh, on on these actions, but we're hopeful that we can collaborate. Um, we feel like we're going into it with a pretty strong set of actions and um, and welcome the state's feedback if there are ways that we can make it stronger. So I'll just highlight very briefly some continuing actions. This is not necessarily a, um, a complete list, but we, um, 
we obviously want to make sure that we have the appropriate amount of residential land in the city. Um, and so we will continue to do that and monitor what gets constructed in our community um, and uh, rezone as necessary. So our rezoning of sites is usually done at the beginning of the process. So when we start, um, when we start the housing element period, there's a lot of available land for multifamily development um, that we've just rezoned. But we do look at that throughout the housing element period. And if we're seeing that um, land is getting developed with projects that are not affordable housing, we will go back in and do some additional rezoning to make sure that we always have the uh, the proper pool of land available. Um, also, of course, just continuing to coordinate with multifamily developers, trying to uh, provide some incentives to develop, including speeding up their project pro processing, offering some other development incentives that might be things like um, setbacks or parking reductions uh, for affordable housing in particular. Um, and you saw we had our new policy that was uh, taking large lots and breaking them into smaller lots. We also have, um, we have long had a policy where we will help folks to consolidate smaller lots into one larger lot so that they can get to the point where, where a project is feasible. Um, and so we will continue to do that. Um, we do offer fee affordable or fee deferrals to affordable projects. And we work with our partners um, our partner water agencies and sewer district to um, to also provide fee deferrals. And in fact, all of our all of our affordable housing projects that occurred during the last housing element uh, period, so 2013 to 2021, did take advantage of those fee deferrals. Um, and then we provide financial support when we can to affordable housing development. Um, we have in the last eight years provided loans of between two and five million dollars to three projects. We do have an RFP out right now to solicit some new affordable housing projects um, and we will most likely be devoting about eight million dollars to that effort. Going forward we're also looking to um, work with developers on land that the city has purchased to build affordable housing um, and we're looking at some other um, other options to to provide some support to developers to actually get units um, built. So another area that continues to be a priority for us is homelessness. Um, we want to make sure that we are, we are looking at what the needs are of people who are experiencing homelessness, both families and single adults, um, as well as people living in vehicles or people who may be living outdoors. Um, and providing funding to address them. And we, uh, we currently have a number of different ways that we do that, including funding some homeless outreach officers through our police department, um, our homeless services navigator, which is through a nonprofit partnership. Uh, we do have some transitional housing resources and we are continuing to look at new project opportunities um, that, would, that would help people experiencing homelessness to secure permanent housing. We also look at funding, we will continue to fund agencies that provide services to special needs populations. And so we've long had our community development block grant um, that provides funding to a variety of nonprofits serving mostly lower income households. Um, and then we also have our locally funded community services grant, which is similar, um, but not limited to just low income households. And so through those programs, we, um, we are able to help a variety of nonprofits, including the Senior Center, the Food Bank, Meals on Wheels, the Elk Grove Heart, which serves uh, people experiencing homelessness, um, and a variety of other organizations that serve people with special needs. Um, we will also continue to have available an affordable housing database for the public. Um, that is on our website. Uh, we, we are aware that people use it pretty extensively. We probably get 10 calls a week where we refer people to that database um, and, and then they can call each of the properties and find out more about their, uh, about their, their complexes. Um, in line with some of the other development incentives that we offer, we wanna continue to offer development incentives for special needs housing. Um, when it's proposed. Um, 
We currently have a minor home repair program that assists homeowners to make necessary health and safety repairs. And whether we do that as the city or partner with a nonprofit, we do anticipate continuing to offer that to help um, conserve our existing housing stock. Um, and then, of course, we want to continue to connect to lower income households to SMUD um, mpg and &E assistance programs, as well as different assistance programs that might be available. Um, we do have a couple of nonprofits that will provide funding for, uh, for water utility bills. Um, and in some cases, internet, particularly during COVID. So we want to continue to make that connection for our community members. So there is some, um, as always, there is new state law that we need to uh, address in the housing element. One of the newer state laws is, um, is SB 35. And that provides some streamlined approval process and standards for eligible projects. Um, basically, it, it makes the CEQA process easier um, for those projects and, and they can be approved more quickly, provided that they um, provided that they meet certain criteria. So we will be, we have a, an action related to that. Um, we also must amend our zoning ordinance to add some lower barrier entry practices. Uh, for navigation housing. And I'll go into that a little bit more in depth um, in a future slide. Um, and then of course, we also will amend our zoning ordinance to allow supportive housing um, without discretionary review, like a um, conditional use permit in all zones that allow multifamily housing or mixed use development. Um, right now, supportive housing is allowed by right in all residential zones, um, but this would expand it to um, non-residential zones. So our key new actions, and we have we have quite a few new actions. Um, one of the actions is replacing units uh, when redevelopment would displace existing lower income housing. So if there is a project that has um, that has I don't know twenty units on it, and those units are going to be demolished, and a newer, bigger project will be built. Um, that new project must include at least 20 units of lower income housing. Um, so making sure that we're not losing housing resources to make way for something that isn't affordable. Um, our, our action four is the lot configuration and the large lot development. Um, that action really focuses on um, on number one, the component of the lot consolidation that we, or sorry, the lot splitting that we talked about um, so that developers can get size, property sizes that are manageable for development. Um, and then also adopting some incentives related to, you know, setbacks and design fl flexibility um, and maybe parking standards to encourage projects. Um, and then we have action six, which is uh, looking at zoning for missing middle housing types. This would be typically um, more moderate income housing. Uh, so people generally earning between 80 and 120% of the area median income. Um, and, and for that population, um, townhomes, duplexes, triplexes, um, and uh, condos, can be a very viable housing option um, that, that can be affordable, uh, developed at, at a price point that is affordable to those moderate income households. And so we want to look at our zoning and look at opportunities for including more of those housing types that could serve those moderate income households that are not being served by the new housing that's being built in our community today. Um, action number seven, development streamlining is really related um, to the state law to SB 35 um, and how we, how we move eligible projects through the process more quickly. Um, and then we have the parking study. So our, we anticipate con conducting a parking study to look at whether multifamily housing parking requirements are appropriate. Um, and possibly looking at some reductions to the minimum parking requirements, which would, uh, which would allow more of the property area to be used for housing potentially and less for parking. 
um, what we've heard from the development community is that building um, building units above parking, so building parking garages or putting parking underground is prohibitively expensive. Um, and we and we may um, we may have some some extra capacity at some of the apartment complexes um, that we could reduce and, and therefore try and get more units um, in future projects. And then we have action number 13, which I talked a little bit about. That one is meant to um, lower the barriers for our navigation centers. So um, looking at making sure that in navigation centers, people are allowed to bring their partners Unless the, unless the project is very population specific, like say a shelter just for women. Um, also allowing pets um, and providing space for people's possessions. Pets, partners, and possessions are three significant barriers um, to finding housing for people experiencing homelessness. Um, and then another fourth component that, that is a part of this uh, new state law is making sure that we provide some privacy for folks um, staying in navigation housing, such as either providing a private room or providing some partitions around bedroom, around the beds, so that people do have some private space for, for sleeping. Um, and then we have our um, supportive housing. And again, this one appeared earlier too. This is the new state law um, that looks at making sure that if supportive housing units are a component of the project, that that project is allowed without a conditional use permit or other what we call discretionary re review. Um, and then utility assistance, um, that was covered a little bit before. We did flesh out this action a little bit more, especially, um, especially since the pandemic, we've seen a lot of people have higher utility bills. Um, often, you know, what we've seen through our nonprofit partners lately has been in the thousands for SMUD and PG&E. And so our program includes a component of continuing to fund some utility assistance through our nonprofit partners. Um, and especially related to COVID. Um, right now, there's a great opportunity. If any of you are aware of anyone who um, has had their impact, has had their income impacted by COVID, the um, Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency has a program out that can help with back rent and back utilities for low-income renters. Um, so we will be looking at how we how we help folks um, get into that program, as well as providing potentially some utility assistance for homeowners who haven't been covered under some of the federal money that's flowed for rental assistance. Um, action number 19 is tied to a new, um, a new requirement from the state, which is that housing elements consider affirmatively, affirmatively furthering fair housing. And that has long been a requirement of um, at the federal housing agency, so the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, as a region, we underwent um, what is called an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. We worked together as a region to complete that over the last couple of years um, and adopted it last year. And in that, it lays out some actions that the city can take and the region can take to look at furthering fair housing. Some of those are transit oriented. Some of them are education oriented. Some of them are um, making sure that we fund new projects um, when those are available. And so there's, there's a, I won't go through all of it, but there's a rather long list of things we can look at to advance that goal in the housing element. Um, we also added an action related to innovative housing options. Um, we've seen a lot going on throughout the state about what jurisdictions are doing and different housing types that they're accommodating. Um, mixed use housing remains popular. Transit oriented development um, is a common topic. Um, and then even things like tiny homes um, and other, other housing options for people experiencing homelessness or people who may have special needs. I mean, we want to we want to have a program that looks at how we can incorporate those types of innovative projects into our community. Um, and the last two new key actions that we have are are somewhat related. Um, the Housing Choice Voucher Program is a countywide program that is run by the Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency. 
you might be more familiar with it as the Section 8 program, um, but we are trying to help to publicize that program and gain greater acceptance of that um, from landlords. So we'll be working with our rental registry um, to share information about that program and the laws surrounding it. Um, it, is, it is not legal to discriminate against a Section 8 um, voucher holder anymore. Um, and so, uh, so we want landlords to know that as well as about some of the incentives that um, SHRA has for folks who accept those. And then we also have a housing choice voucher education component, which is focused on people who both need the voucher um, and community members um, to, to better, um, better understand the program and the needs of the folks who, um, who use housing choice vouchers. So those are some highlights of our key new actions. Um, and I will talk a little bit about this. Um, oh, are we at Q&A? OK, perfect. All right, thanks, Sarah. Um, so this is a good opportunity to take a pause before we go into next steps and hear if you have any questions or comments. Um, so you can uh, use the raise hand feature if you'd like us to turn mics on. Um, if you're on your computer, there should be a button at the bottom of your screen, the little hand sticking up. You can click on that, and then we can call on you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I don't see anybody that's calling in today on a landline or a cell phone, but if you were, you could press star nine uh, in the hand raised there. Um, and of course, I don't see any Q&A that's come in through the Q&A button. Uh, again, if anybody has any questions, it's a good opportunity. And not seeing anything. So Sarah, why don't we jump on to the next step so we can come back if anybody has any questions again at the end. Okay, perfect. So we, um, we do have a plan for getting this adopted by May 15th. And, uh, you know, as you can see, our project schedule here, the housing element, um, as Christopher mentioned at the beginning, is out for public review right now, as is our draft EIR. Um, we have a series of planning commission hearings planned. Um, we will be um, taking the bulk of that in April. Um, we do have an informational session planned for them on the 18th and then a couple of meetings in April, one to discuss the policies and another one to discuss the sites. And then following that, we will be taking the housing element um, to the city council. So I will highlight again, um, here are some of the key dates um, for the for the CEQA document for the EIR. The comment meeting is March 17th, so it's coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, as I mentioned, the planning commission will be taking uh, a, a high level housing element basics um, overview on uh, on March 18th, and then uh, for the for the EIR and the public review draft of the housing element comments are due to the city on March 29th. Um, and then April, um, April, Christopher, you might want to help me with the dates here. I know April 22nd, and then there's a, um, the first regular planning commission meeting in April. Um, they will be hearing the, um, the housing element. The policies will be the first meeting in April, and then April 22nd is projected to be the site's discussion. Um, and then in May, I believe it's May 12th, um, it will go to City Council for a hearing and, and hopefully final adoption. Right, so um, that's all correct, Sarah. So yeah, we're planning, we're trying to target the April 1st Planning Commission meeting to go through um, essentially what we've presented here today with the bulk of the document other than the sites themselves. Um, and we're planning on a special planning commission meeting on April 22nd. Uh, the reason for that is just to make sure we've got the noticing periods all lined up correctly. And it's really more driven by the EIR than anything um, that we need that date. Um, uh, so the planning commission has a recommendation to the city council that night on the 22nd, um, then we're targeting May uh, 12th for the city council date. That's a regular city council hearing night. Um, but of course, hearing notices for all that will go out as, as necessary. Um, so we do have two questions that popped up in the Q&A. Uh, we will go to those now. Paul asked, is there a list of city owned parcels that are zoned for multifamily development in the housing plan documents? 
Uh, there are some housing, uh, some city owned sites that are in there. I'm gonna jump over to the map real briefly that we showed a little bit ago, uh, just to highlight this. Um, site E18, Echo 18, which is at the northeast corner of Bruceville and Bighorn. Um, it's actually right here. Uh, that is a city owned property and is one that's um, on the existing list. Uh, we're looking, uh, so it would have carried forward as part of this. Um, there is a county owned property, C13, which is here uh, that we're considering adding to the list. And then there are um, one or two properties at E16. E16 is made up of, I think, three properties, three parcels in total. Um, we own two of them, and there's a third one that's in private ownership. Um, the, the city is looking at opportunities around the city for potential acquisition for housing sites as part of our um, affordable housing program. Um, uh, but we don't have anything to share on that today. Um, there are a couple of other sites the city owns that have been surplus, but they're for other projects at this point. Um, they've not been identified for housing development. Um, and then we have another question that's asked, uh, where do I find more about the Quail Bruceville property that is built and is there a second property being built on that land? Uh, what is the screening process for residents, background checks, et cetera? Um, so yes, there's a project on this exhibit. It's uh, actually in between E2 and E3. It's this little void space between, uh, that's the Quail Run phase one project or Quail One project that's in construction right now. And, uh, is having signups, I think. Uh, Sarah can talk about this in a moment. Um, and then there is uh, a phase two of it, which was approved at the zoning administrator hearing earlier this week um, and may be going to construction uh, later this year, early next year, um, once they get their financing completed. So Sarah, do you want to talk more about the, the screening and, and all that? Yeah, sure. So, so the project that's um, being constructed right now is called the Gardens at Quail Run. It's 96 units, um, 95 of them are affordable housing. One is for the on-site property manager. Um, the, in this case, the maintenance supervisor will be living in that unit. Um, and so those 95 units um, are considered workforce housing. They are affordable housing. The rents range from around $500 on up to $1,200 or $1,300, depending on the income targeting of the unit and the number of bedrooms. Um, that process, uh, that project does have, as do all of our affordable pro projects, a screening process for residents. And so generally what they're looking for in residents, um, first and foremost, is making sure that their income does not exceed the limits for the property or for the particular unit that they're planning to um, rent. And then they also look at, um, at previous rental history, um, generally, they're looking to see that folks have, have been able to pay their rent on time in other properties. Um, they do a credit and a criminal background check, um, and they are looking for folks who make twice the monthly rent. Um, we do have the lottery entries um, for that property are being accepted through the end of the day today. Um, if you're interested in registering for that lottery, um, there's a, a link on our um, Facebook page. You might have to scroll down a little bit to get to that posting. Um, but those, those, um, those units, that lottery has generated an enormous amount of attention. Um, we have had over 10,000 entries for, um, for what is less than 100 units. Um, and so it really underscores the need for affordable housing in our community. Um, we do anticipate that the other piece of the property there um, that as Christopher was saying, went to the zoning administrator hearing earlier this week. I think it's about, it's a little over a hundred units. Um, and we do anticipate that they will develop that as, as affordable housing of a type similar um, to what the, what the front part of the property is. Um, if you're interested, the same developer um, built the project that is next to the Nugget Markets that isn't too far away from the gardens at Quail Run site. Um, it's called Avery Gardens, um, and we expect that gardens at Quail Run will have kind of a similar um, similar feel to it. The uh, so next question we have, will the video or audio recording from today be posted to the website? Yes, um, it'll take us a couple of days to get it up because we send it out for closed captioning uh, so that it's uh, available to a broader audience. But yes, it'll be posted up there. The prior webinars are up there as well. 
Um, I'll have the link up on the screen in a moment, but it's elkgrovecity.org slash housing elements. Uh, next question, what has been done to address District 4 feedback about high concentration of housing here? Have candidate sites that were considered for removal in other districts been added back to help with the gap in inventory? Um, so the map up that's on the screen right now, uh, those are all the existing candidate sites that are being considered right now. No decisions have been made uh, by the commission or the city council to remove any sites. Uh, we're gonna be presenting some data as part of the, the public hearing process, um, looking at ways of, of how we uh, categorize the neighborhoods that those are in um, and, and address some of those concerns. I will note that when it comes to District 4, which is predominantly um, uh, sort of south of Elk Road Boulevard and much of the new developing area, um, those areas were planned early on with housing sites, uh, multifamily housing sites in them. So you'll see a lot of the E sites, the existing sites that are down there. Um, there's two candidate sites, C1 and C24. C1 is actually already a, a zone for multifamily. Um, we're considering uh, increasing the density there, but it's it's a little odd that it's not quite an exact uh, addition. It's um, uh, just really more being added to the list itself and potential uh, density increase. And then C24 is a site the city's been working on right away acquisition for the extension of Lots Parkway. Uh, and there's some remnant property there that might be developable for um, higher density housing. So that's being why it's considered a candidate site. Um, but yes, as you can see from this exhibit, we are looking at candidate sites around the city uh, and the distribution question is a factor that uh, will go into recommendations. And uh, I, I know the council is interested in looking at the concentration question as well. Um, I see we got a hand raised, uh, so I will go ahead, uh, Dan. It looks like the mic is still off. Should be able to unmute your mic now, Dan. Oh, he's been answered. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, well, not seeing any other questions. Um, we're going to hang out for another minute or so. Um, but again, if you haven't been to the website to check it out, uh, please do so. A lot of great information up there about the project as well as the draft materials. Um, and of course, you can fill out the uh, online survey about the um, candidate and existing sites and, and your suggestions there and leave us feedback about it. Um, we also have the sign up for the CEQA meeting. Uh, again, it'll be on March, uh, later in March, so you can go sign up for that. And there's also the mailing list. Um, we'll send out updates as we go through the process and um, let you know about the hearing date. So please make sure you're signed up for that as well. Um, so thank you all very much for spending the first part of your afternoon with us. We appreciate it. Uh, glad you're able to join us. And um, thanks and have a great rest of the week. Take care.